I originally wanted to do this video live, but constraints between work and family make that difficult to plan. So I figured I'd just record the video and share it with everybody. So uh, this is a bit longer than my previous videos because it's a lot of, of my experiments combined together into one as I try to better understand espresso. So um, I titled it The Mystery of Espresso because I still find espresso to have a lot of mystery. Um, no matter how much data I seem to collect, I end up with more questions than answers. So let's talk about some stuff. So I want to quickly talk about uh, the metrics of performance that I'm going to use. I'll talk about staccato espresso and then um, comparing coffee machines and coffee grinders. Um, and these, these explorations have led me to a deeper understanding of espresso, as well as a deeper understanding of what I don't know about coffee. So um, I originally made this taste panel um, back in 2019, when I was trying to get a better understanding of why one of my machines wasn't performing well. And so I thought about what tastes were interesting to me. Um, so I have sharp, rich, syrup, sweet, sour, bitter, aftertaste, and final score, which is just the average. Um, and they all have a, a connection to with um, cupping protocols, but I am not a trained coffee cupper. So I've tried to keep my own scale and I know that taste is subjective, but I want a way to quantify it so I can make improvements off of it. For quantitative metrics, I use total dissolved solids, um, which you can then use to derive extraction yield. And this is read using a refractometer, either an optical or a digital refractometer. Most of my data is from a digital refractometer. And then I made another metric called intensity radius, which looks at the radius from the uh, origin to a data point on the control chart. And the control chart uh, compares uh, TDS and extraction yield. And this is a way to normalize between um, either slight differences in ratio or very large differences in brew methods, uh, like pour over versus espresso. So uh, most definitions of espresso come down to a certain amount of coffee in, a certain amount of coffee out, and in a certain amount of time. I like to define espresso by strength and extraction yield. So this is that same control chart with a bunch of my data plotted on there and some general definition buckets of what a ristretto or regular or lungo are for espresso. Um, and I think that uh, this is a better way to define and be able to compare uh, espresso um, that is, is much more quantitative. When talking about extraction yield and taste, often there's this discussion of how well they correlate to one another. So I plotted my data so I could better understand. And one of the challenges is that I have data across a variety of roasts with changing uh, techniques. So it's hard to say outside of a single roast how well they correlate. Um, so this chart is uh, normalized extraction yield by roast and normalized taste by roast to better understand how they correlate. Um, and they loosely fit this curve I've generally found that a extraction yield increase of about 0.5% or higher is noticeable in taste. Um, so I think they're still both valuable guides. And alone, you know, they it might be easier to say, well, if you have extraction yield, you need a taste metric, or if you have a taste metric, you need an extraction yield metric. Um, and that's why I present both because I want, I want to give as much information around the topic as possible. So let's talk about the coffee bean. So this is a beautiful green Robusta coffee 
um, and with a, a roasted sample next to it. The beans are very large. I'm very much in love with Robusta. Um, so uh, one thing that is talked about is how long a, a coffee roast has to rest. Um, so to better understand this, I had a lot of data on uh, coffee roast and I had these two metrics. And so I could look across time after uh, roast and with some normalized scores, I could see how well these coffees do. Um, so there is this slight trend upwards. And in general, I found uh, per coffee roast that I can get a better extraction yield after uh, three or four weeks on a medium roast. Um, you have to do some work for a, a dark roast, but it's a waiting game. So usually I'm roasting now for me to drink in a month from now. And this is because of degassing. So this is a graphic uh, from data from Samo and he measured the amount of carbon dioxide coming out of coffee over time. So what was interesting about this graph is that he included both the whole bean, which is the, the, the big long line, and then uh, a couple of, of ground samples at a few intervals to understand the impact of the gases that are trapped within the bean. So when you look around the four week mark or the 30 day mark, you start to see that the total amount of gas coming out of the bean is lower than the, the amount of gas that comes out of the coffee bean after you roast it or after you grind it, sorry. And uh, so this is saying there's still a bit of gas trapped in there. And this, this amount of gas in, in total affects how quickly you can uh, extract coffee. So one way to uh, fight that and increase degassing is what I call humidified coffee, but it's just adding moisture. So in this case, I used a humidity bag because I saw a James Hoffman video where they talked about coffee aging and put a, a humidity bag in coffee for six weeks. I don't want to do six weeks. I thought maybe I'll try it after a week or two. And I noticed some major changes. So the coffee was a lot coarser. So I had to go to a much finer grind setting to hit the same coffee grounds distribution and to get a similar shot time and, and extraction yield. And then I, I went on to experiment with a, a couple of different roasts and looking at um, a taste and extraction yield. And I found big improvements in taste and, and uh, statistically significant improvements in extraction yield. So I was pleasantly surprised and I was also able to use the coffee sooner rather than um, waiting for three or four weeks. It was able to bring my uh, consumption time down to uh, one to two weeks. So one interesting aspect of espresso is staccato espresso. While this is generally labor intensive because you're sifting coffee, it provides a platform to learn how water flows through coffee. Because in this case, the coffee should have a more even extraction because the water flow comes through more even. So to prepare staccato, I sift coffee using two sieves in uh, usually a, a crew sifter, but now I've been using a um, fellow sifter for the fine layer and then a crew sifter for the coarser layer. So the orientation that I found optimal through taste experiments is fine on the bottom, coarse in the middle, and the, the middle layer on top. So my initial taste comparisons were over uh, a, a batch of shots across a few different machines. And I found big improvements in taste across, um, across all of these machines and across all of the roasts that I use. So I took a bit of data after, this was before I got a refractometer, I did this, these tests and developed staccato. And then I um, used a, a 
refractometer to get some data on some paired comparisons. So uh, really staccato and regular shots, back to back, same output, same input. And um, the staccato shots had higher extraction. This is, uh, this graph shows extraction yield for the one to one and the three to one. Um, and I have the three to one because I was using a lever machine. And after you pull out the cup from the one to one, water's still coming out. So I put another cup underneath and I recorded data from it. I didn't drink it though. So I wanted to dig further into this. So I did a salami shot with um, regular. I did um, a paper filter, which I call a PF PFF. In the middle, I did a paper filter on bottom, staccato, and then staccato with a paper filter in the middle. Um, or, or really, it's really above the fines. So uh, this uh, showed that the extraction rate for staccato was just plain higher than the rest. And so you're, you're hitting a, a, a very high ratio in the first one-to-one. -one. If you go beyond that, you're, you're risking over extraction. While a regular shot has to, to be pulled for longer to hit the same extraction yield. So this is the question that's taken me a while to answer. Um, and I feel like it's multifaceted. So part of this has to do with the bean itself. So I looked at the bean and I found that the inside of the bean was softer than the outside of the bean. So I wondered if that uh, could be an indicator of why staccato works, because maybe the softer inside part of the bean pulverizes faster and into finer particles, which would mean that the bottom layer would be the inside, more of the inside of the bean than the outside of the bean. And when I first did the experiments, I looked at uh, the layers separately. So I pulled a shot of just under 400 microns and I noticed it lacked certain flavors while the coarser particles lacked the opposite flavors. So the finer particles were sweeter, but they didn't have the punch, like the, the real like kick, while the coarser particles lacked any sweetness. So I uh, looked at the, a coffee bean with a durometer and I measured hardness. So here's a couple of hardness values. So uh, on the outside it was 17, on, on the inside it was five and then 10. Um, so I wanna do an experiment to separate out the fines. So my theory is that fines pulverize from the inside, pulverize faster. And so what if I use a coarser grind setting? So I did a setting 50 on the niche um, and then I looked at the particle um, distribution and I said I could just use a, a sifter and pull out these finer particles. Um, so I decided to make a, a more labor intensive shot called the inside out staccato shot where you grind coarse, sift out these finer particles and then regrind the coarser particles. Um, and then layer the uh, inside finds, uh, then the outside finds, and then the, the coarse and then the mid particles. So I wanted to go a bit further than just making the shots. I made the shots, right? They tasted better. But I took each of those layers and I wanted to do a test. I wanted to understand how each of those layers extracted over time of a shot. So in this case, I wanted to make a salami shot, but I wanted to isolate carbon dioxide and um, coffee extracts. And those are the two main things that cause channeling and coffee. So I wanted to remove channeling. So I looked at spent coffee. So what if I make a po coffee puck of mostly spent coffee um, and some large percentage of coffee grounds from uh, other parts of the bean and uh, then measure that uh, the extraction rate over uh, a few cups. So I first had to make spent coffee, which turns out to be a bit more difficult than I would have thought. So uh, this coffee went all the way up to a 55, close to 55 um, to one ratio 
and it was still extracting something. There was still a little bit of coffee coming out. So I still had to use a control of spent coffee and estimate the amount of spent coffee that I was extracting and remove that from the total amount of coffee extract that was coming out. Um, but it was a very interesting experiment to understand how difficult it is to really pull a long shot and get everything in coffee. So I did this sifted salami shot with these inside finds. Now I have two different inside finds. I have the less than 300 microns and the greater more than 300 microns. And then I have uh, outside finds, outside mid-range and then outside coarse. And so you could see the extraction rates here um, are very interesting because the inside finds really do extract faster than the outside finds. Not only that, they extract, fully extract almost instantly, it seems. In the, in the, around the one to one, you're already at the range you'd prefer, which is 18 to 22% extraction yield. And it's these coarser particles that you have to wait for a while for them to extract. So as a result, the coarser particles are, are by the time you get to an extraction rate where the coarser particles have more fully extracted, the finer particles have over extracted. And, and that is one of the challenges of regular espresso shots. And that is one of the benefits of staccato espressos. The, the coarse particles have a longer contact time than the fine particles. So you allow the coarser particles to more extract and the finer particles to not be as over extracted. So what else can we learn from staccato? We can look at staccato tamping. So part of what my understanding of staccato was is that you had a compacted layer on the bottom. And this compacted layer was doing something to the rest of the puck. So what if we um, dose part of the coffee, t distribute, and then tamp pretty hard, and then um, dose the rest, and then tamp again? So I, oops. I found this technique to be useful and it improved extraction yield and taste. And it also, it was able to get me halfway there to sifted staccato with all, without the extra work. So let's talk about Let's talk about my beloved Kim Express. I bought a decent espresso machine about a year ago. And after a few months, I thought my profile was ready to do a comparison against the Kim Express. And the Kim Express is where I pulled many of my high extraction shots. And I thought we were gonna have a good time and, and they were gonna be pretty close. But I ended the test after only 10 pairs of shots because the Kim Express was so much better in taste and extraction yield and TDS, everything. And I did understand why. Um, I had modeled my shot profile after the uh, Kim Express. I had worked on multiple modifications to try to improve extraction yield. And the whole goal of buying a decent espresso machine was to pull a better shot than the Kim Express, or at least have parity without having to hold my hand on the lever. So I took a deeper dive at the Kim Express. And what I found out is that it's doing something that's very fast and hard to see and special, which is steam pre-infusion. So, Within the first 20 milliseconds, a puff of steam comes through the puck. And that steam heats the coffee as well as uh, does some initial moisturization. And this allows coffee to flow more evenly and get an, a high enough extraction yield. And on the Kim Express, I was using a higher temperature. I went all the way up to 120 for some roast because I found that a higher temperature was better for 
for coffee. And part of the reason it, it was better is because it was causing more steam to go through in a higher temperature steam, which the decent espresso machine was not doing because it was not going to that, could not go above 105 Celsius, but was also not designed in the same way where when you pull the lever down on the Kim Express, you have a, a area inside the piston that's filling with steam very quickly as the water is vaporizing instantly. So this is true for most lever machines. And I think this is why lever machines have typically been better than um, uh, uh, other ma machines like the E61 or the decent espresso machine. However, it wasn't really clear why. But usually with the lever machine, you have to have the boiler temperature high enough that you create enough internal pressure to force the water out. And as I did some tests, I realized that I needed a higher, a higher temperature could get to a higher extraction yield and there was some trade-off between taste. So the tasty point really changed um, as I was experimenting. So it's easy to see this in really slow motion. So I took slow motion videos and then I slowed them down a few more times. Um, so you're, you're, you can see individual frames, you can hear it, um, that this is flashing. And then I wanted to emulate this on the uh, decent espresso machine. So I figured out if I used a low flow profile, the water would enter the group head. And if it was above 90 C, you started to generate some steam. And if you went up to the max of 105 C, it would vaporize and you get some steam going through the buck. Um, now there was a balance there between how much steam went through the puck before you started to just have water settle on top. But I, uh, I worked out some interesting profiles as a result. I love the sound it makes, this rushing steam through the piston. Reminds me of a rocket ship. So I took some videos, I changed the exposure to better understand, to, to see this and slow it down. Because it was a little tricky to see. Okay, here it is on the decent. Um, so I've, I've been toying around with this quite a bit. I've made a lot of modifications since these original videos, um, but I'm, I'm pleased that I was able to make some headway into getting parity with the Kim Express. You can hear it going. see it just a little bit there it's coming out again it's steam so it's hard to see until it it starts to condense um, but it's definitely there you can start to see it there before the, the water even comes out and this is typical of the profiles I run is I can I can see and feel the steam coming through the puck and when it does that it's able to um, heat the puck more evenly. Because one of the issues occurring is that the sides of the basket are heating up faster than the center of the puck, especially in the descent because there's this hole in the center uh, where water's not coming through that screw. So the sides of the, the basket heat up faster and as a result, they, um, they cause the coffee around it to be hotter and hotter coffee extracts faster and that starts a chain reaction that um, ultimately causes channeling. So here's the hack. I do a, a very low um, flow control, like 1, 0.1 or 0.2 milliliters per second. This was a little bit longer than what I've been doing now, but this was a great start. 
and then I uh, start to fill up the, the basket and then I have a manual, uh, two manual steps, one to uh, cut off flow once the basket, the filter screen covers and then the other is once about half the dose comes out, so about 10 grams comes out. So I, I did just a quick comparison between a couple shots of decent espresso, decent with steam preinfusion and the Chem Express. And um, the taste uh, was, I greatly improved the taste. Um, I didn't quite get better. I mean, in one, it got like slightly better, but the uh, TDS and extraction numbers really improved. Um, so it gave me hope that this was definitely the right way to go. And it kind of validated my understanding of how the lever machine works and how the decent espresso machine works. Um, this is not my current profile, but this was my current profile back when, where I would do some steam pre-infusion and then um, uh, do a couple steps. So let's look at grinders. So I did this analysis with the um, niche versus the rock. And I remember when I started using the rock, it had gotten a lot of crap from people in the coffee community. Um, while I thought I was getting pretty great extractions, a lot of people seemed to dismiss my data just simply because I was using the rock grinder. Um, so I bought the niche because I just wanted to stop doing manual grinding. And I didn't do a side-by-side -side comparison because I was involved in some other explorations at the time. But I accidentally started using it um, in a way to compare it. And I found that the rock was doing better. So I really took a dive on, on collecting some data between the two. So I found out from a taste perspective, the rock was better. From a, a TDS and extraction yield, the rock was also better which was surprising to me. So I did some more investigative work and I checked out the grind distributions. So what was shocking to me is when I dial in the coffee for both grinders, the grind distributions were almost the same. There was not an indication in there of why uh, one would be better or worse than the other. So I took a deeper dive. I used a uh, pattern recognition to better understand the two grinders. So I had images of the coffee particles and I applied linear binary patterns to them. So a linear binary pattern is uh, used in image processing in pattern recognition, where you have a single pixel and you look at the eight neighbors and you ask this question is, is this pixel larger or smaller in value? Um, and if it's larger in value, it gets a one. If it's the same or less, it gets a zero. And then you have this pixel pattern. So what's interesting about linear binary patterns is that they are rotation invariant. So this pattern could be rotated and you could get the same pattern just shifted. So there's only 59 unique shifted patterns um, possible. So I took the patterns and then I applied k-means clustering. So k-means clustering takes a um, number of, of points in some dimensional space. In this case, we have 59 dimensions, but in this sample graph, we have two dimensions. And uh, you start out with, you, maybe you look at this data and you say, I think it has two clusters. So you pick two random points and you find all the uh, points that are closest to one one center and one that's all closest to another. And then you recalculate these centers and then you recompute which, uh, where points are closest to. Um, and then after a while you have a clustering of sorts that um, has some crossover, but is, is useful for a more intuitive way to look at pattern recognition. So I looked at 16 um, cluster groups and when you look at these cluster groups for less than 500 microns in, in um, particle size, uh, they're the same. They have about the same distribution of particles. 
when you look at it for particles greater than 500 microns, you see a big difference. Um, so this led me to this hypothesis that maybe it's the rock is producing better coarse particles than the niche. So I did a sift and swap. I sifted both coffees and then I swapped the fine particles from the rock with the fine particles of the um, niche and I pulled some shots. So in the shots, I found that um, from both taste and um, extraction yield, doing this switch really brought the, um, the um, taste in line with, with expectation. The niche was able to perform like the rock when using the coarse grounds from the rock, which indicate to me that the, the rock is doing something different, uh, maybe for the breaker burrs at the top, I'm not sure. Um, but it was interesting because it, this method is good for comparing grinders, at least in trying to understand where are their differences. So I did the same thing for the ode. So I borrowed the ode with SSP burrs from Brian and did a comparison over a number of shots, a number of roasts. And I found there wasn't much difference. I didn't find a difference in taste. I didn't find a difference in extraction yield. So I apply the same analysis and I found out that they bin pretty similarly. That um, when looking at uh, particles of similar sizes, that they group together. So in on the left, I, I took these binnings of these 16 binnings as, uh, for, um, as a uh, feature vector and I compared all the um, particles in each bin to each other to understand how well that they um, match up. And I found that for the same particle bin, there's uh, no differences. Um, and for different particle bins, yeah, of course there's differences, but they follow very similar trends. So even when I looked at um, the graph on the right, which is the um, dissimilarity score, uh, they are very similar up until about 500 microns or 550. That's, that's where you kind of get in trouble, but that is also where there's not that many particles left because these are espresso grinds. So in summary, we talked about metrics of performance. We talked about a deeper understanding of staccato espresso. And then we went into some comparisons of coffee machines and grinders. Um, and really, my aim is to uh, better understand espresso. And espresso is, uh, has so many variables involved that it really reminds me of multi-layer uh, neural networks where you don't understand what's going on inside each layer and you can only see the input and the output and so you kind of had to poke at it in different ways to get it to, to bend to your will and, and find improvements. So I hope this was helpful in, in your espresso journey. And this has uh, definitely been a, a great stepping stone for mine.